This video is sponsored by bootcamp.com. Check it out for INBDE prep and use coupon code MENTALDENTAL for 10% off. Hey everyone, Ryan here and welcome back to our oral medicine series. This video will focus on gastrointestinal diseases including acid reflux and peptic ulcer disease. So let's start by talking about gastroesophageal reflux disease or acid reflux. Now before we talk about the disease process, we have to talk about what normally happens. So your stomach naturally produces gastric acid and this is used to help digest food. And its pH is very low, somewhere between 1.5 to 3.5 so that it can do its job effectively. The good news though is our stomach lining is designed to handle these acidic conditions, but not so much the rest of our bodies. And sometimes that gastric acid leaks upward in the wrong direction or refluxes into the esophagus, throat, and mouth. And that's how we get the name gastroesophageal reflux disease. Now a little bit is no big deal, and it's quickly buffered by our saliva but if it occurs consistently over the day or during the night when we produce much less saliva, then we can start to experience some problems like heartburn and tooth erosion, which we'll talk more about later. Here's another gastrointestinal disease, peptic ulcer disease. And this one also involves acid, but it's a lot more complicated. I'm gonna to try to keep it really, really simple though. Basically, there's a breakdown of protective factors like the mucus gel that coats our stomach lining and normally protects the gastric epithelium from its own acid. So when that breaks down, this leaves the gastrointestinal mucosa or lining susceptible to harm, and then it gets burned by the acid, causing a break in the lining of the stomach, or esophagus upstream, or duodenum downstream from the stomach. The most common cause of this is infection with a gram-negative spiral bacterium called Helicobacter pylori. Now when it enters your system, it makes its home on the stomach lining and protects itself from the acidic environment by secreting ammonia. Perhaps this ammonia weakens the protective coat Others say it causes increased gastric acid production, but either way, it enables the stomach acid to wreak havoc on its own lining. The second most common cause is chronic NSAID use, which is important to know for us because we prescribe NSAIDs fairly often. NSAIDs block cyclooxygenase 1, which in turn inhibits prostaglandin production, which usually helps protect the stomach lining, once again weakening the lining's defense and allowing the stomach acid to wreak havoc. Other risk factors include old age, smoking, alcohol consumption, physiological stress, the use of nitrogen-containing bisphosphonates, and the use of some anticoagulants. Now, what medications are there to help combat GERD and peptic ulcer disease? Well, antibiotics like amoxicillin or metronidazole can be prescribed to eliminate H. pylori if that's the etiology of the peptic ulcers for a given patient. Antacids can provide quick relief for GERD or peptic ulcers, but they aren't generally recommended nowadays, especially for peptic ulcers because they won't actually fix the problem, just the symptoms, and only temporarily. Also, an important drug interaction to know is that antacids, as well as dairy products and other agents containing divalent ions like calcium and iron, will chelate or bind and interfere with tetracycline, erythromycin, and some other antibiotics and limit their absorption and subsequently their effectiveness. So keep that in mind when someone's taking antacids. It might impact antibiotics. Ranitidine is a histamine 2 or H2 receptor blocker or antagonist. Now this one has a lot of benefits actually. This medication is selective for the parietal cells in the stomach, stopping them from responding to histamine and therefore stops them from secreting so much acid. 
It's over the counter, it's inexpensive, and it doesn't have very many drug interactions to worry about. Omeprazole is a proton pump inhibitor, and it has a much stronger effect than ranitidine because it completely blocks influx of protons, or acid, into the lumen of the stomach. As such, it also has much more drug interactions to worry about. It can reduce the absorption of ampicillin, ketoconazole, and itraconazole. It can also increase concentration of benzodiazepines, warfarin, and phenytoin. So just, and there's more drugs out there that it interferes with, those are just a few. But it's a very, very effective drug and is commonly prescribed for dealing with either GERD or peptic ulcer disease. All right, so patient considerations for these two conditions. If a patient experiences GERD, then we really want to ask about their diet. Acidic foods and drinks can exacerbate acid erosion of the teeth that may already be taking place from GERD. So we should ask about this and encourage the patient to think about their diet if acid erosion is already a concern. And we can assess their salivary parameters such as pH and buffering capacity. It's not something we think about often, but it's actually a good idea in these patients. There are commercially available diagnostic kits out there that can be used to test things like flow rate of the saliva, for instance. For peptic ulcer disease, the big one here is to avoid NSAIDs, as they're absolutely connected to peptic ulcers, like we just talked about two slides ago. If you absolutely have to use an NSAID, opt for a COX-2 selective inhibitor like Celecoxib, brand name Celebrex. Otherwise, use acetaminophen as the alternative analgesic. Consider good oral hygiene. It's kind of silly to think about because we want to do that in all of our patients, right? But especially here because H. pylori is a bacterium and bacteria can harbor themselves in dental plaque. So keeping your teeth clean can actually help prevent spread of that microorganism. Antibiotics taken for H. pylori should keep dental infections in check as a side effect, but if the patient needs another antibiotic for a tooth issue, you need to make sure you select a different class of antibiotic than the one they're currently using so you don't double up and mess up your dosing. And then, of course, keep the drug interactions in mind that I mentioned on the last slide. I just went ahead and listed them out here as well. Okay, now for oral manifestations of these gastrointestinal diseases. The oral cavity is intimately related to the digestive system because it's technically a part of it, so we would expect, certainly, some complications or manifestations of those diseases in the oral cavity as well. Anytime systemic antibiotics are in the equation, you have to consider fungal overgrowth as a side effect. Since a lot of these antibiotics are broad spectrum, they'll wipe out some of the good bacteria in our mouths as well. So then fungi can take over and cause candidiasis, or more specifically could manifest as median rhomboid glossitis as shown here. Proton pump inhibitors can also alter taste perception, and erythema multiforme has been reported in some people who take H2 blockers or proton pump inhibitors. Erosion of enamel due to regurgitation of gastric acid is extremely important to talk about, and we will in the later slides of this video. And proton pump inhibitors are especially notorious for causing dry mouth, which will make erosion worse, and then of course increase your risk of bacterial infection, caries and periodontal disease, as well as fungal infection, candidiasis. Like we've seen in so many of our other oral medicine videos, xerostomia just comes up again and again and is a part of many of these oral medicine topics that we've talked about. All right, let's focus a little more on tooth erosion because this is a good topic to be familiar with for the board exam. There are three different age groups of patients that I consider to be at risk for erosion. Those are teenagers, middle-aged people, and the elderly. 
So for teenagers, they're more at risk because they have a higher rate of eating disorders and higher consumption of sugary drinks. Bulimia specifically is most common in teenage girls, and high consumption of sugary drinks like sodas and sports drinks is especially common among teenagers involved in sports. For middle-aged people, they're at higher risk of GERD or acid reflux like we've just been talking about, certainly can result in tooth erosion. And they're also more at risk for obstructive sleep apnea or OSA, which we'll talk about is a comorbidity for tooth erosion. And the elderly, they're more likely taking lots of different medications, which is known as polypharmacy. And that's a risk factor for xerostomia, which reduces buffering capacity of the saliva and increases your risk of erosion. Now let's talk about how erosion actually manifests and how we can see it manifest in our patients. Perimolysis is a fancy term for acid erosion due to gastric acid. And there are three telltale signs of tooth erosion. So cupping refers to smooth bowl-shaped dots on the cusp tips. So to be clear, when we're dealing with acid erosion, something is dissolving tooth structure away. It's not wearing away. Restoration standing proud refers to the fact that tooth material is dissolving faster than the restoration is. So the restoration ends up sticking up in relation to the surrounding tooth. And loss of anatomic detail is known as the whipped clay effect. And it results in a loss of ridges and grooves because enamel melts away. And finally, the last thing I want to talk about is what I call the sleep acid triad. Basically, the idea here is all three of these things tend to occur together. Not always, but there's a strong correlation between these three things. Someone with acid reflux is more likely to have obstructive sleep apnea and is also more likely to struggle with grinding their teeth at night. Likewise, someone with sleep apnea is more likely to have GERD and nocturnal bruxism and so on. GERD is also more common in patients with asthma, and it's also exacerbated by the use of beta agonists, a category of asthma medication. And we mentioned this in the video on COPD and asthma. And just so you know, for coming attractions, we'll talk about obstructive sleep apnea in the next video. That's it for this video. Thank you so much for watching. Please like this video if you enjoyed it, and subscribe to this channel for much more on dentistry. If you'd like to support me, please check out my Patreon page. And thank you to all of my patrons for their support. You can unlock access to my video slides to take notes on, and practice questions for the board exams. So go check that out, the link is in the description. Thanks again for watching everyone, I'll see you in the next video.